We are coming on the air with a decision that could upend America's immigration system now in the hands of a federal judge. After arguments today on whether President Biden can lift a pandemic policy keeping asylum seekers out, we're going to get the view from inside the courtroom and what officials want to see the president do next. Plus, a lawyer for Brittany Griner says the WNBA star is going to be stuck in Russia for at least another month after a pretrial hearing today. Some players are now calling out the White House, demanding they do more. And nurses across the country are breathing a sigh of relief because Redon Vaught, who we told you about yesterday, will not see any prison time. Why the judge is deciding she should spend her sentence on probation instead of behind bars. Plus, a House committee investigating baby formula manufacturers because of the shortage that's sending some parents into a panic. A doctor is going to join us on how to feed your kids safely during the crisis. And love is in the air. And for some couples, the pandemic could not hold them back. So we're gonna go inside the metaverse for a wedding that is in tonight's original later in the show. Hey everybody, I'm Yasmin in for Hallie tonight. And right now the fate of thousands of people at the border is up to a federal judge, all because of a challenge by Republican state attorneys general against President Biden's decision to lift Title 42. Uh, this is the policy, by the way, used by former President Trump at the start of this pandemic that allows the United States to turn away or expel immigrants due to COVID restrictions. The president wants Congress to come up with an immigration solution instead of relying on this public health law. Even some Democrats have joined Republicans criticizing Biden's decision uh, since border crossings in March hit levels, by the way, not seen in four decades. They're worried that border towns might actually get overwhelmed. And then in the balance, asylum seekers risking their lives to get to this country. The Coast Guard saying today 11 people are dead after a boat capsized off of Puerto Rico. 38 people have been rescued, and the search is on for more survivors as well. Morgan Chesky is joining us from outside the courtroom in Lafayette, Louisiana. Morgan, as always, it's great to see you. The deadline, by the way, May 23rd, the judge committing to giving a ruling before then. How did this play out in the courtroom today? Yeah, Yasmin, good afternoon. And it was very interesting to hear such a huge issue relating to the border being discussed right here in Louisiana. And that was because that it was the Attorney General Jeff Landry here in Louisiana that joined the Attorney General in Missouri and in Arizona when this lawsuit was filed back in late April. Since then, states that are led with GOP leaders, more than 20 of them have joined the lawsuit, in fact. And uh, they came here today because that deadline, as you mentioned, May 23rd, was when Title 42 was supposed to end, supposed to expire, according to the Biden administration. Uh, and their argument was, if that was to happen, these mm -hmm. states that were part of this suit, uh, some of them would be essentially, in their words, overrun by a surge of migrants. And in order to make their argument, Yasmin, they cited Department of Homeland Security Security, which said that there might be as many as 500,000 people that would cross the border should Title wow. 42 end. To back that number up, they pointed to a record number from this past March where more than 220,000 people crossed. And I want you to hear what representatives from those states had to say uh, following these oral arguments uh, that concluded just a short time ago. Take a listen. Administration's COVID policies, I mean, the only word that comes to mind is completely incoherent. The administration is demanding that Americans be vaccinated or lose their jobs. It's fault tooth and nail for that in court. But at the border, it doesn't matter. And that really was one of the key points that those states tried to make versus the Department of Justice, Yasmin, in that they pointed to the fact that the Biden administration, if they don't have mandates in place, they are still arguing on behalf of mandates, such as those with vaccines. And they say, why is that the case there when at the border they're lifting Title 42, which is a public health, which is due to... Uh, for the sake of public health. In the meantime, uh, DOJ officials who did not speak publicly after this hearing uh, made a key point here, and they said that the CDC, which is in charge of uh, calling Title 42 into effect, has a very narrow spectrum of responsibility in that their key job, essentially, is to mm. identify health emergencies and react accordingly, and that they shouldn't necessarily be responsible, Yasmin, of any consequences that happen as a result of. Their key job here was to make sure the fact that COVID-19 was properly responded to by enacting Title 42 
but that it shouldn't necessarily be the responsibility should there be an impact regarding immigration. Hey, j j just quickly here, Morgan, because you talked about the numbers of folks that could possibly come across um, the border when, when Title 42 is lifted, lifted on, on May 23rd. What are some solutions they want to see in place, especially those local officials that are so worried about this? Yeah, that's a very good question. I had a chance to visit Eagle Pass not too long ago, and they say that in light of another policy being presented, Title 42 is a tool that has at least allowed them temporarily to keep a surge from coming across even more. It will remains to be seen if it will expire or not on May 23rd. If the judge comes out and rules on behalf of the DOJ here, Yasmin, expect the states to appeal this uh, to a higher court, which will be in New Orleans, and we'll hear these round of arguments yet again. But as of right now, there is not uh, really a viable argument being presented that would supplant Title 42 in handling the numbers of people that we're seeing coming across. We're going to be following this, and I know you will um, as well, Morgan. Thank you uh, for now. We appreciate it. Um, so while the president is waiting for that decision, he's also pushing state and local officials to use money from the American Rescue Plan, by the way, to fight crime, where in just the last couple of hours, he is dismissing a phrase you've probably heard a lot. The answer is not to defund the police. The answer is to fund the police with the resources and training they need to protect our communities. And the White House is pointing out uh, they're far from defunding the police, about $10 billion from that $1.9 trillion package already being used for crime prevention. It's money helping recruit public safety workers, fighting domestic violence, upgrading equipment, and much, much more. I want to bring in Mike Memley, who's been following this for us um, as well. Mike, it's great to see you as always. Listen, we know the American Rescue Plan obviously uh, connected to COVID relief here, COVID relief uh, money, that being said, uh, the money that was approved it is so much more than just for this pandemic. Why is the president, um, from your sense, making this push now? Well, there are a few reasons, Yasmin. And think about how many times you and I have talked about what we would just refer to that $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill, right? Well, in fact, there was a lot of smaller components of that that maybe weren't explicitly about things like vaccines and some of the mitigation steps like masking and the like uh, that we would come to think about. In fact, $350 billion out of that $1.9 trillion was basically a pot of money that was made available to state and local governments to spend with great latitude. And what the president is now saying, there's another wave of that funding that's being made available, the Treasury Department transferring that to state and local coffers very soon, is we think it would be a good idea for you to use this money to do things like train your law enforcement, to maybe hire more law enforcement. And part of this is just because the president thinks it's a good idea. Remember, he's always kind of run as a law and order Democrat. Yeah. But this is also a little bit about what we often see happen in the summer months. There tends to be a spike in especially violent crime in urban areas in the summer months. And so the White House, the president really trying to get ahead of that, lay down a marker for especially the Democrats, who he knows in this midterm year, are going to be really cast as more about defunding than funding the police. The president trying to use his bully pulpit to send that message today. I mean, listen, the president um, throughout his time in office has continuously tried to separate himself from the movement of defunding the police, making it clear, in fact, that he supports um, the criminal justice system here in this country, uh, the police specifically, right? So, so how much is this about messaging, especially, listen, you mentioned the rise in crime that we will likely see in the summer months, but we have seen a spike in crime across the country in major metropolitan areas as well. So how much is this about kind of political messaging as well? So, yeah, it's been something very unusual happened in the 2020 election, which is that a Democratic president was elected by some 7 million votes in the popular vote overall, but his party actually lost seats in the House. And we, other than that Georgia runoff, he almost lost seats in the Senate. And what the Democratic strategists who analyze those results say really was a big reason why Democrats lost seat, especially in the House, was because the Trump campaign and Republican candidates cast Democrats as responsible for a lot of the public demonstrations, the mm. violence, the increase in crime. And so this is the president trying to send a message, as he has done by standing with New York Mayor Eric Adams, for instance, that Democrats are really the party of law and order. Talking points we obtained from the White House uh, today talk about, actually, it's Republicans who want to defund the police because none of them voted for the COVID relief law, which includes this money for law enforcement. All right, Emily, thank you as always.
Good yeah. to see you, my friend. All right, the man accused of opening fire in a New York subway last month, pleading not guilty today to one of the most violent attacks in the history of the city's transit system. Uh, Frank James, you see him there, uh, accused of setting off smoke grenades, firing shots during the morning rush hour, injuring 10 people. The attack setting off this major round-the-clock manhunt, which many of you remember, for James. Police finally found him about 30 hours or so later, about 1 p.m. the next day. Uh, we still don't know the motive for this attack. Police saying, though, James, who is a Bronx native, posted videos on YouTube before the incident where he talked about New York City Mayor Eric Adams, complained about homeless people in the subway as well. Uh, just some evidence there um, to talk about. Ron Allen covering this for us uh, in Brooklyn. As always, Ron, um, great to have you on. This thing was pretty short, the hearing wrapping up uh, within 30 minutes or so. To take us inside the courtroom today. The main thing was he entered a plea of not guilty. And perhaps the most striking thing was his demeanor, that he is a much different individual than you see in those videos where he is ranting and raging about all manner of issues from politics to race uh, to you name it. Uh, he even talked about his own mental health, saying that he is a product of the failed mental health system in New York City. And that has been an issue hanging over this. And it came up today in an indirect way. The judge asked James numerous times. Are you, do you understand what's happening here? Do you understand the charges that are against you? Um, mm. And they asked his attorney if he was competent to stand trial. And all the answers to that were yes, affirmative, which means that this will go forward and that he will be tried. Now, we didn't learn a lot about motive. We didn't learn about what the plan may have been, which is mm. what a lot of people are still wondering, because even though he did fire some 33 rounds, he had much more ammunition in his bag there. He also had a, a, a storehouse of weapons in a warehouse somewhere in Philadelphia. So, and this happened in an immigrant neighborhood on the edge of New York City, not in the heart of New York City, where the train that he was on was headed to. So there's a lot of questions about whether that was in fact the destination. None of that came up at this point. The main focus though is to read the charges to him, which include a charge of uh, trying to carry out a terrorist attack against mass transit and using a firearm to do so in a violent crime, both of which can land him in jail, prison, for the rest of his life if convicted. Uh, so that's where we are now. Uh, again, just striking how his demeanor was much more diminished, I should say, than the rants and raves that we saw and heard in his videos on YouTube. Hey, just quickly tell us, I know we haven't heard from James's lawyers um, necessarily as of yet, but what's the timeline we're looking at for this thing? The next hearing is late July, July 25th. There'll be a process now of discovery where the prosecution gives the defense all the evidence they have. And we understand that there's a lot of evidence because we know that James left, allegedly left a lot of things on the train, including the weapon, including car uh, keys to a U-Haul tr truck van that he had rented. There, there's a lot, there are a lot of eyewitnesses who saw the individual who carried this out. And presumably they will point the finger at James. Uh, again, this is going to go on for some time. The next hearing is July 25th. His lawyer has said that there shouldn't be a rush to judgment, that he should get a fair trial, and that, and they asked for a psychiatric exam at the last hearing. So there's all that as well. But, but again, next hearing, July 25th, and he will stay in custody. He was denied bail. Ron Allen for us. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Want to get to the latest on Ukraine right now. A lot of stories that we're following today uh, where Russia finally answered U.S.'s calls after weeks of trying. Uh, today, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with his Russian counterpart for the first time since Russia invaded Ukraine back in February. The call lasted about an hour. Secretary Austin called for a ceasefire and also said he wants to keep the lines of communication open. All of this while Kyiv launched their first war crimes trial, a 21-year-old Russian soldier accused of shooting a Ukrainian man while he was riding a bicycle. If he is found guilty, he could be looking at life in prison. And on the ground in Ukraine, it looks like Russia's withdrawing their forces from around Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. That is according to Western officials. They say Russian troops have been losing ground there and will probably redirect their troops southeast. Cal Perry is here to walk us through all this stuff. Um, as always, Cal, it's great to see you. Let's start with a phone call uh, with Secretary Austin, finally getting in touch with Russia. It seems like he tried and tried and tried. It didn't come. They hadn't spoken since before the invasion, February uh, 18th. Now they're connecting. What does this say to you? 
Well, certainly significant that they're connecting at all. We had two readouts, one from the American side, obviously, one from the Russian side. Um, no difference on who initiated the call. Both sides says it was the United States who initiated the call. We know the call was about an hour long, and we know the American side called for a ceasefire. And we have not heard that a lot from the Pentagon. In fact, when General Austin was here, he talked about degrading the Russian military. So that is a slight change of tune. On the Russian readout, um, it was discussed international security, according to the Russians, and the situation uh, in Ukraine. So a slight difference in the readout. But again, the importance is that they talked at all. And the length of the call, one hour, I think surprised a lot of people here in Ukraine, Yasmin. Want to talk about the war crimes trial that we just mentioned. The prosecutor on this case saying she's looking into over 9,000 potential war crime cases just like yeah. the one we were talking about. How would this, how would they even go about prosecuting that number of, of individuals? And I'm wondering, Cal, um, if all of these soldiers they're mentioning, these cases they're talking about, these war crimes, some of which are they in captivity? Yeah, it's unclear. Um, we don't know how many prisoners of war are on the Ukrainian side. And, and what makes this so unprecedented, of course, is that it's a war crime trial taking place in a country that is still at war. Um, it is something that the International Criminal Court is supposed to take care of. It should be mentioned neither Ukraine nor Russia signed on to the Rome uh, Accords, which set up the ICC. You're looking on the left side of your screen there. This is pictures from today's court appearance from this young Russian sergeant who is accused of killing an elderly man, killing him when his unit and his uh, commanding officer thought maybe that elderly man was signaling Ukrainian troops as these Russians were fleeing, having just fallen victim to a Ukrainian counterattack. Uh, what is clear about this is that Ukraine is sending a message. They're sending a message to, they hope, Russian right. soldiers who are still fighting in the eastern part of the country, that there will be some kind of accountability in this country. But the legality of this is incredibly tricky. Here's what the defense attorney said, the defense attorney provided by the state, as to what could be some circumstances that would mitigate a possible sentence. Take a listen. Сценарієм захисту в зазначенні справі може бути все що завгодно, про що ми домовимось з моїм підзахисником. Є певні пом'якшуючі обставини, є обтягчуючі обставини, є момент визнання події злочину, є момент того, що особа може сказати, що це не він зробив. There, there is the obvious reality here uh, that this is a young Russian soldier on trial in Ukraine, again, yeah. wh while this war is ongoing. So the symbolism of this trial, I think, is what is partly most important to officials here, Yasmin. Right, more symbolic um, than anything else. L let's talk here military strategy, what we're seeing on the ground there, specifically seeing these images coming out of the steel plant. We've been talking about that um, for weeks, obviously. Some people throughout the last couple of weeks have been evacuated from that steel plant. Others are still inside. We're hearing now of this withdrawal from Kharkiv, wondering what you're hearing about that on the ground. And then, of course, the Russian strategy possibly of shifting to the southeast. Bring us up to date. Yeah, so Ukrainian military officials say this withdrawal from Kharkiv is because this is where the Russians are, are taking significant losses, and they're swinging these troops to the east, to the Donbass, um, where Russian troops are making some advancement. Though, we had the blowing of these pontoon bridges by Ukrainian forces in the last three to five days. And what it seems to have done, at least according to them, is trapped a number of Russian troops across a river and made them vulnerable from attacks on either side. While that happens, the situation in Mariupol really remains the same. There has been no movement on the negotiations for these 38 very heavily wounded soldiers that were told by the deputy mm. prime minister. And again, that last holdout continues to be a holdout as Russian troops have conducted more than three dozen airstrikes in the last 24 hours, Yasmin. Cal Perry, as always, good to see you. All right, let's stick with Russia for just a moment. A lawyer for WNBA star Brittany Griner saying today that Griner's pretrial detention in Russia has been extended for another month until June 18th. Uh, Griner was let out of the courtroom in handcuffs today. Uh, her lawyer saying the short extension of her detention may indicate that her case will go to trial soon. Uh, today, Press Secretary Jen Psaki reiterating the Biden administration's position that Griner is being wrongfully detained. But WNBA player uh, Alicia Clark is urging the White House to do more. Clark today tweeting this. It has been 429 days since I played basketball, but that means nothing compared to the 85 days of our sister Brittany Griner being wrongfully detained in Russia, adding, know that we are watching White House. Griner was arrested at an airport in Moscow after vape cartridges containing oil derived from marijuana were allegedly found in her luggage. Joining me now with more on this is um, Kathy Park. To say that the United States and Russia are um, not in good uh, relations at the moment, not on good terms at the moment, um, is putting it lightly. 
with all that being said, Kathy, what can we make of this delay in Griner's hearing? Hey there, Yasmin. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And according to the New York Times, it is actually not unusual for the Russian courts to uh, have this sort of delay right before trial. But as you mentioned, we have this complicated relationship with Russia. And I think it's important to note just extraordinarily um, just how this all played out, the timeline of all this, because Brittany Griner was detained one week before Russia invaded Ukraine. So there have been growing fears that perhaps she is the this pawn in this ongoing crisis. But the State mm. Department has come out saying that she has been wrongfully detained. So that is a, a classification that allows the U.S. to be more aggressive in securing her release. Right now, she is looking at up to 10 years in prison. Oof. But there is a glimmer of hope, though, because, as you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a prisoner swap with Russia, with, with Trevor Reed, a former re Marine. So there is some hope that perhaps similar circumstances could also play out for Brittany Griner as well. So, so here's the thing. It seems as if the U.S. Embassy has not had a lot of luck uh, in maintaining contact uh, with Griner while she's being held uh, in Moscow. It seems as if though the State Department has now come out and said they have made contact. The embassy uh, in Moscow has now made contact. What are they saying about her condition, how she's doing after being held in captivity for so long? Yeah, I think everyone wants to know how she is doing. We saw a, a photo of her today coming out of the courtroom. She was uh, in an orange hoodie. She was looking down. She was in handcuffs. We couldn't see her face, so it's unclear physically how she is doing. However, the State Department has said she is doing the best she can, considering how exceedingly difficult the circumstances have been for her, Yasmin. All right, Kathy Park, thank you for staying on this for us. We appreciate it. All right, everybody, a bit of good news from Wall Street today. We've been watching stocks bounce back uh, from a week of sharp losses. Uh, that was rough the days leading up to this. The S&P 500 rose 2.3 percent. The Nasdaq jumped by over 3.8 percent in its best day since mid-March. The Dow added more than 460 points. But Twitter was still in the red after Musk uh, tweeted his plan to buy Twitter is on hold until he gets more information about how many fake accounts there are on the platform. So Elon Musk announced last month that he intends to buy Twitter for $44 billion. And he has previously tweeted that one of his main priorities would be to remove, quote, spam bots from the platform. Musk, who is expected to serve as Twitter's temporary CEO if the deal goes ahead, would have to pay a $1 billion breakup fee should he choose to walk away. Want to bring in Jake Ward, who's been following this for us. Um, Jake, good to see you once again. Let's talk through some of this, because I, I got to say, I woke up this morning shocked to see this, not even understanding really what was happening here. If you look at what Twitter was valued at before today's announcement, the company value had fallen to $9 billion. That obviously is not good for someone who's offering to pay $44 billion to buy Twitter. So I'm wondering, Jake, is this a way for Musk to renegotiate his offer uh, for Twitter, or is this deal in trouble? Well, this is certainly the question. You know, I've been speaking to analysts today, Yasmin, who, who say this is probably a renegotiation tactic of some sort. Because, you know, when you line up to buy something like Twitter, you're not allowed to walk away just because the stock price has dropped and the value of that company has dropped, uh, you know, as compared to the, the price you were originally ponied, ponying up to pay. Um, he's not allowed to walk away for that reason. He has to actually have a material change in the value of the company. And typically that's something like a regulator getting involved or your third party financing falls through. And so it may very well be that bringing up this issue is an effort to try to bring up something that could affect the price. But you and me both, I mean, when I woke up as well, you know, the first thing I do, I look at my phone and there's that thing and you know, oh my gosh, yeah. we're going to be talking about this all day because it is such a crazy thing to see him suddenly put on hold this incredible deal that had us all transfixed even before now. So yeah, well, a and very it strange as if he, day here. Yes. It seemed as if he was being painted as this kind of savior for a lot of Twitter employees that were feeling down and out about the company um, right about now. With that being said, and of course, there's a lot of other controversy surrounding him buying Twitter, but that's a whole nother conversation. Can you explain to us the fake account uh, thing that he's talking about there in his in his tweet? 
Well, certainly spam bots have been a problem at Twitter, as they are all across social media. We have seen, you know, soft power efforts uh, across the world. You know, you have um, uh, people uh, using automated bots to try to push a particular line of reasoning. We've seen uh, hostile states do this. We've seen uh, political campaigns do this. Bots are basically part of the sort of, you know, information wars that take place on social media all the time. But the important thing in the context of this, whether it affects the acquisition, is that Elon Musk knew all about this. In going into mm. this deal, as you mentioned, he in fact knew all about it. He talked about wanting to rid the company of spam bots. So I don't know how he's going to make the argument that he didn't know about this before now or it wasn't disclosed right. adequately and that's why he's put it on hold. They are definitely a known thing in this constellation of, of uh, you know, in the information world here, Yasmin. Hence the reason why they feel as if maybe it's just a renegotiation tactic. Hey, just quickly, as we've been watching the stocks go up and down um, throughout the week, tech stocks specifically affected. Why are we seeing so much volatility there? You know, it's just incredible to watch, uh, you know, all of the, the tumult of right now. And basically the first quarter of 2022 is, is as bad as the Nasdaq has seen it since the first quarter in which we were in the pandemic. Right. That's the weirdness of the moment we are in. And it's because all these tech stocks are getting hammered, especially the winners from the pandemic. Stocks like Zoom and Peloton, you know, which did so well during the pandemic, are not doing well now. You combine that with the fact that, you know, investors really jumped ship from tech stocks and moved to things that were more reliable. They thought like energy. Turns out energy is not reliable when Russia invades Ukraine. So all of this adding to incredible volatility in the market right now. Seems like there's not a lot of reliability when it comes to the market. But when is the market ever really reliable. Jake Ward, as always. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jake. Come up, everybody. The nurse we told you about yesterday who gave a 75-year-old woman a fatal dose of the wrong medication sentenced. Why Radonda Vaught won't be doing any prison time. And a journalist killed during an Israeli raid has been laid to rest in Jerusalem. More on that ahead in The Five Things. All right, just a couple of hours ago, former nurse Radonda Vaught was officially given a three-year probation for the accidental killing of her 75-year-old patient, Charlene Murphy. Uh, the judge saying it was because Vaught expressed remorse in court and had no intent to violate the law. It is coming after a really emotional day uh, where Radonda took to the podium for the first time, talking about how she's lost so much more than her career. I will never be the same. When Ms. Murphy died, a part of me, a part of me died with her. So we reported on Vaught's conviction yesterday. The case put a real spotlight on just how much nurses should be held responsible for mistakes made in the hospital. Vaught was convicted of criminally negligent homicide and abuse of a patient for injecting her patient with the wrong medication and had been facing up to eight years in prison. Katie Beck is joining me now with more on all of this. Katie, thanks for following this for us, um, joining us on this and all the great coverage you've had, of course, on this ish issue. Um, Vaught's not going to be serving any prison time, as I already said. Uh, the charges can even be wiped from her record if, in fact, she meets the terms of her probation. What is your takeaway here from what we saw in court? I think the big takeaway is that a lot of people in the medical community, nurses included, are watching this decision and they're very fearful. They're, um, they're very apprehensive about what the future looks like. If one nurse can be held to this standard where jail time is the repercussion for a medical mistake, why would people be signing up to, to be in this industry that naturally mm -hmm. creates a culture of long hours, difficult days, emotional toll, uh, mistakes are made, but I think a lot of nurses in this case fall to the line of what about the accountability for the hospital? What about the system here? Uh, why is Redonda Vaught the only one who seems to be facing accountability and at such a steep level? Um, so I think there is a chilling effect that is going on throughout this industry right now that is already experiencing a massive shortage. Uh, wondering, you know, is this going to be the standard consequence for a medical mistake, mm. and mistakes will happen again. Right, right. Um, you know, it's interesting because you brought us a lot of this coverage, and that is, of course, what nurses are saying, what the medical community is saying. I know a lot of people, there's been a groundswell of support for Redonda throughout this entire thing, especially 
um, when it comes to her not receiving jail time. What are some of these nurses, um, healthcare professionals that you've been speaking to in contact with? What are they saying now? What are their reactions? Well, across the board, all of them agree that this should not go without punishment, that her actions were an egregious error and there was a human life that was lost in this. So not, not to overlook that, um, taking away her license, you know, stripping her of her ability to be a nurse, none of them disagree with that. They are not saying uh, that she should be put back in a hospital. What they're saying is that the hospital she worked for has seen no real repercussions. They've seen mm. no system changes. They didn't report this for more than a year. She worked on the job for a year before this was ever discovered um, that this had happened. So they say, what is going to happen from this? Nurses are going to be more hesitant to report a mistake, which means less fixes for actual mistakes. Um, they're saying it's not going to be helping this system repair itself if people are afraid that if they do tell the truth, they will be facing jail time. Right, afraid of the consequences. Um, Katie Beck, as always, thanks so much. I uh, want to get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know tonight. Number one, the United Arab Emirates' long ailing ruler, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nayan, died today. He was rarely seen in public following a stroke back in 2014. The UAE announcing a 40-day period of mourning to honor the 73-year-old. Uh, number two, the funeral for a Palestinian-American journalist turned into chaos today as Israeli police stormed the crowd, beating them with batons and causing pallbearers to briefly drop the casket. Thousands gathered in Jerusalem to honor Shireen Abu Akhle, who witnesses say was killed by Israeli forces. The broadcaster was covering raids in the West Bank for Al Jazeera before she was fatally shot. Uh, number three, Mercedes Benz is recalling 292,000 SUVs and telling owners to stop, stop driving them until they can be checked for a problem that could cause the power brake system to fail. The recall includes models from 2006 to 2012. The car company saying there's been no reported crashes or deaths related to this issue. Number four, a 48-year-old Nepali woman scaled Mount Everest for the 10th time this week, breaking her own record for the most summits of the world's highest mountain by a woman. And on the same day, seven climbers became the first all-black expedition team to reach the summit as well. And number five, Jen Psaki gave a final briefing before leaving the podium after 16 months as the White House press secretary. I want to thank all of you in this room. Um, you have challenged me, you have pushed me, you have debated me, and at times we have disagreed. Um, that is democracy in action. And Jen Psaki will be replaced by Karine Jean-Pierre. Still to come, everybody, Texas's Supreme Court says the state can investigate families providing gender-affirming care for their kids. What led to this ruling and what comes next? And Congress is trying to take action on this nationwide baby formula shortage. But what should parents do right now if they're struggling to feed their kids? We're going to get into that after the break. First, the White House, now Congress, getting involved with finding answers for American families about the nationwide baby formula shortage. Not long ago, uh, the president laid out the federal response to getting more formula on the shelves. And then just a few hours ago, NBC News learned the House Oversight Committee pressing key manufacturers for information on steps they're taking to address the issue as well. Lawmakers sending letters to the heads of four companies that control nearly 90 percent of the U.S. market for baby formula. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also saying the Appropriations Committee will hold a hearing next week. Meanwhile, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki saying they've been working with manufacturers for weeks, leading to companies like Gerber increasing production by 50 percent. That's where we all are now. I want to bring in Dr. Kavita Patel to talk more about this. Um, th this is kind of awful, this whole story that's, that's playing out uh, in front of us right now, this the shortage that we're seeing when it comes to baby formula. This is something that babies need, children need across the, the country, families need across the country as well. As we're seeing lawmakers working on this um, in Washington, D.C., what can parents do, families do, to continue to feed their children safely here in the United States? Yeah, yeah, I think the key word there is safely. So number one, be in touch with your pediatrician. I know that Jen Psaki offered the call your doctor advice. I'll go a step further and say <clears throat> pediatricians and primary care family medicine doctors have access to formula. And especially if your baby has a certain type of formula that they need, certain types of enzymes. And this is where the shortage is particularly hard is on that subset of babies 
that need something different than what's just on regular shelves and they can't even get that. So talk to your doctor, call their office. And then the second is to be on social media, but be a, kind of alert to where you are getting this from. Nonprofits in the area, diaper banks, food banks, we're all trying to get and collect formula to give to people, but make sure that it's a valid source, something reliable yeah. so that you don't have to worry about it. And then third, avoid trying to do any homemade formulas or diluting your current formula. I know it seems tempting, but that can actually hurt your baby. You're bringing up the community. That, that's major. I'm seeing in my own community on like on baby mom groups as well. People reaching out yeah. saying they have extra formula, wanting it to give to other moms. Um, also, we're seeing obviously these images across the board of empty shelves and grocery stores um, and Rite Aid, CVS is across the board as well. Um, I want you to take a listen to some of what we're hearing about this. Next time you go to a town, like, hey, do you need anything? Like, should I check the shelf for a certain formula? I've seen moms in the store crying in the formula aisle because they can't find their baby's formula. We've searched shelves from Texas to Colorado to Oklahoma to Kansas City, anything and everything, and it, they're empty. You heard those states are Texas, Colorado, Oklahoma. Much of the burden with supply chain issues like this, with inflation issues like this, when it comes to baby formula, for instance, it's falling on communities that are low income, uh, that are rural as well, people that can't get to the place that they need to go in order to find the formula that they very much need. Can you talk a little bit about how we are seeing this specifically affect those communities? Yeah, so this is a problem, and you mentioned supply chain. It's it's interesting. Even if all four of the major manufacturers were to say that they could resume all the manufacturing, including Abbott, which had their Michigan-based factory shut down because of concerns by the FDA, valid concerns, even if everything were to kind of double in manufacturing capacity, we still have the parts of the formula that are in scarce supply. And then, as you're pointing out, the trucks and the people going from end to end, Yasmin, isn't easy. And if you're in a rural area, there might not be that many stores that stock this on their shelves, and they are not able to get the product. And I have heard, even in rural areas, about people who are concerned, and I can see how one would do this, to buy weeks and weeks of supply of formula. But we're recommending moms, try to parents try to hold off, buy one to two weeks for now. Mm. So, yes, it does hit people hard. And then I'll add another layer of why it hits rural and kind of low-income communities harder. Many low-income families get their formula through a program called WIC, Women, Infants, and Children. And that like program actually offers free or heavily, heavily low-cost formula. But that is in short supply, too, especially wow. if you're limited to certain formulas. So you can see where this adds up. And this was a crisis, I'll say, not just weeks in the making. This is a crisis that has been decades in the making because we mm. have pretty much allowed for these monopolies to happen. We've also restricted the trade for some of the external or foreign suppliers, formulas from Europe, for example, to come into the United States. Yeah, it's astounding to think four companies making 90% yeah. of the baby formula. Just astounding. Uh, Dr. Kavita Patel, as always, thank you. Uh, let's talk Texas for a moment. Texas's Supreme Court ruling on a big issue, gender-affirming care for trans kids. The court reversing an injunction blocking the state's child welfare agency to keep investigating parents and doctors who provide those services to kids. Uh, back in February, Governor Greg Abbott ordered child welfare officials to investigate reports of gender-affirming care for kids as child abuse. The Texas Department of Family and Protective Service says it has opened nine investigations so far, but today's ruling is mixed. The court also ruled in favor of a family that was one of the first to be contacted by child welfare after Abbott issued the first of its kind order. Uh, this is happening, by the way, as GOP lawmakers across the country have been moving towards imposing similar restrictions on transgender rights. Major organizations like the American Medical Association opposing these kinds of efforts, saying gender-affirming care is medically necessary. Joe Urkaba joining me now to talk more about this. Joe. Good to talk to you. Um, this news breaking today, um, to say the least, um, really astounding. Um, has both sides claiming a win of some sort, as I kind of laid out there. Walk us through what exactly the court is saying here. Sure. So the Texas Supreme Court partially upheld an injunction blocking one investigation that you mentioned into the parents of a transgender girl. But it struck down the rest of the statewide injunction, which might allow the eight other investigations to resume. And as a result, you can take a look at this statement from the attorney general, Ken Paxton. 
who said on Twitter that he just secured a win for families against the gender ideology of doctors, big pharma, clinics trying to trans-confuse innocent children. But the ACLU and Lambda Legal are also claiming a victory, and you can see their statement where they say the decision is a win for our clients and the rule of law. The Texas Supreme Court made clear that the attorney general and governor don't have the authority to order D the Department of Family and Protective Services to take any action against families who support their children by providing them with gender-affirming care. Joe, um, I, I did a story on this, um, a, a Texas family uh, with a transgender son, um, the mom's name, Amber Briggle. I texted her uh, today to ask her about her reactions to, to this ruling. And I just want to read for you her response to me. And she said this, I feel like I'm in a dark room with a monster and I don't know where it is or how it will attack me next. So I just keep punching in the dark, hoping I can land a blow and slow it down. And as I mentioned, Amber has a transgender son um, at home. Talk about the real life impacts of a ruling like this. Sure. Yeah. So there are so many of stories, many stories just like that. I actually also spoke to a Texas parent today named Katie, and she told me that her 15 year old son texted her and asked her to pick him up from school early today because he heard about the decision and was, quote, in panic mode. Uh, wow. And her son had previously told me that, you know, this stuff has been really scary for him. It's caused him to disassociate. He feels like he's had to harden himself to not feel overwhelmed by all the news. And the family is planning to move to, to Denver as a result of these investigations. And Katie actually told me that because of this decision, she's considering uh, planning to do the move even sooner. Wow. You know, we talked quickly um, as I came to you about other states that are pursuing kind of similar restrictions. What does this mean for those states? Yeah, sure. So this specific ruling won't have an impact on these other states, but it does represent what's happening in many of these other states, especially in Alabama, where a law took effect Sunday that makes it a felony for doctors to provide gender affirming care to minors. And they're waiting on a judge to decide whether to issue an injunction there. So trans people there are facing an even more extreme version of what we're seeing in Texas right now. Joe Yurkeba, thank you. Uh, still ahead, everybody, hundreds of people in Southern California forced out of their homes as a massive fire rages through the area. Details on that coming up in the local. Plus, student loans are at the top of the list for a lot of voters ahead of the midterms. We're going to talk to voters in the swing state of Wisconsin to find out what they really want. That's next. NBC News covers hundreds of stories each day. And because you couldn't possibly read, watch, or listen to them all, our teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we like to call The Local. From our West Coast Bureau, hundreds of people are still under evacuation orders in Orange County, California today as the coastal fire rips through the area. Over the past three days, it's burned through 200 acres. Hundreds of firefighters are on the scene, officials saying they've been able to contain about 25% so far. From our DC Bureau, crews have pulled out one of two construction barges that have been floating in the Potomac River. There's still another one stuck in the remnants of another dam. Officials saying they're monitoring that around the clock. The barges broke offshore and traveled miles because of choppy waters. And from our Northeast Bureau, New York City is holding its first ever Asian American and Pacific Islander cultural and heritage parade this weekend. It is happening Sunday, a day after a Japan Day parade, another first for the city. Officials are calling the events historical moments as activists raise awareness following anti-Asian attacks during this pandemic. All right, college students celebrating graduation this time of year are being hit with a harsh reality. The stress of student loan payments, the moratorium expiring this August. The pause on payments started back in March 2020 under the Trump administration at the beginning of the COVID pandemic and has been extended five times since, most recently over inflation concerns and rising gas prices. But as inflation gets higher, the value of a dollar goes down, meaning you're paying back your student loans with money that is worth less now than when you borrowed it. It is a 2020 campaign issue now front and center for young voters heading to the ballot box this year. Shaq Brewster made his way to Swing State, Wisconsin, where college graduates are looking for relief. This weekend in Madison, a new class of college graduates. For some, the realization of crushing debt. I'm graduating with about $65,000 in student loan debt. With $25,000 of student loan debt. And I'm graduating with no student loans. Thank you, Mom and Dad. About $70,000. And it kind of sucks. I'm not feeling too great about that. 
Experts say it's a student loan crisis, the cost of college higher than ever. More than 43 million Americans owing a collective $1.7 trillion in college debt. For this group of friends, more than $150,000 borrowed. Something that is on your mind always, like it informs every decision that you make after you graduate. Now presidential political pressure is growing. Biden lost my trust because I'm a college student, so that student loan slogan was really, really something that we look forward to. In 2020, then-candidate Biden followed his progressive colleagues, supporting federal forgiveness of some student loans. I proposed and, and the House, Nancy, put it in the plan to immediately provide $10,000 in debt relief as stimulus right now. The White House now teasing an announcement within the coming weeks as a pandemic-driven pause on federal loan repayments started under the Trump administration and extended by Biden is set to expire August 31st, weeks before the start of early voting in many states. An issue you're thinking about for the midterm elections? Absolutely. Without a real commitment to it, I think there's going to be... Uh, some people who aren't very interested in voting, um, and that's pretty sad. A poll by a progressive think tank shows debt cancellation could impact voter turnout. 45% of voters in battleground states say that with $10,000 in debt cancellation, they are somewhat or much more likely to vote in November, the number jumping to 56% among young voters. Democratic lawmakers argue canceling student debt is a matter of racial justice. The big question is how much can it address? The wealth inequality, the racial wealth gap in America is vast and student loans are maybe a drop in that bucket. The prospect of cancellation already facing threats of legal challenges and political opposition. It's just a bad idea in general. Now the president of the college Republicans, Cranch transferred from a private college freshman year to avoid taking on more student debt. I think it would be really unfair, especially when you consider hardworking citizens uh, who didn't go to college and who don't have those burdens of loans, but where's their money? Where's their relief? Last month, five Republican senators introduced a bill to block future pauses in student loan payments and prevent Biden from unilaterally canceling student debt. The big winners coming from canceling student loan debt, it's not the students. It's going to be the colleges who now have even more of an incentive to hike up prices. As the cloud of doubt and debt hangs over the excitement of graduation season. And joining me now is Shaq Brewster. I'm, I'm so happy you're covering this, Shaq. I got to tell you, when I was out in the streets in Washington, D.C., covering um, the protests um, with the Supreme Court leak, yeah. a lot of the young women I was speaking to talked a lot about student loan debt and wanting the forgiveness and wanting the Biden administration to come through on their promises. So you've been speaking to students there in Dane County, as we just saw. Um, talk about the impact um, in what you're hearing and also the concerns they have in paying back these loans. Yeah, I think some of the impact and concerns overlap the conversations that you were having. The point is, with many of these college students, especially the ones who are now graduating, they heard two years ago much of the conversation from many of the Democratic presidential candidates surrounded the idea of canceling, canceling or forgiving some real widespread amount of debt. That has not happened yet, so they see it as a broken promise. The reason why we focused on people here in Dane County is this is a progressive stronghold in a battleground state. If you have people who are depressed, if you have voters who don't feel like they want to turn out, that could have a major impact when it comes time to our elections. So I, I do want to expand on that a little bit, right, because we're heading towards the midterm elections. They really want to get voter turnout up. Uh, Democrats especially, they're facing the loss of the House, the Senate as well. How connected is turnout right. that you're hearing to student loan forgiveness? And let me just add this, tack this on, this promise of, of possibly yeah. $10,000, is that even going to be enough? Well, yeah, I mean, that is something, if some, there are some voters who say this is their single issue. They see this as a top priority, and you hear the anxiety of some of the people we talk to, some of the graduates we talk to in that story. In terms of the amount, that is where you have a lot of discrepancy. Look at this poll that we saw uh, from just last month. You saw more voters are more likely to vote in the midterm election. Young voters are 50% wow. more likely to vote in the midterm elections with 10000 in debt forgiveness. If that goes up to total forgiveness, that goes up to about 50 56 percent. This is something that young voters say they are watching extremely closely. Yeah, and I, and I believe average student loan debt across the board is, is above twenty thousand dollars or so. So if you're getting a ten thousand dollar forgiveness, a little over that thirty thousand. Yeah, 
30,000. Yeah. So that means you got about 20,000 or so to go, which is um, not easy, that's for sure. Shaq Brewster, as always, thank you. Um, after the break, everybody, some couples are taking their wedding ceremonies to a whole new level. We're taking you to the metaverse in tonight's original. That's next. All right, we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. It's officially wedding season. You may be getting slammed with invites this year after everybody has been postponing their big day due to COVID. We want to show you, though, how one couple, Tracy and Dave, they took their ceremony to the next level, actually into a different universe, the metaverse. Uh, you've heard about it. We talk about it a lot on this show. But now weddings are happening there, too. Callan Rosenblatt takes us there. The wedding of the future is here. Metaverse nuptials. Guests have avatars, venues are virtual, and this is your evite. I now pronounce you husband and wife. That's Dave and Tracy Gagnon getting married in September of last year. They say they're one of the first couples in the world to tie the knot in the metaverse. The ceremony took place simultaneously in the virtual world and in real life in New Hampshire. There were a lot of, lot of things happening around the world with lockdowns and restricted travel and those kind of things. We can get married in real life, mm -hmm. but bring real life into the metaverse. And then anyone who wants to attend in the metaverse could participate with their avatars and our avatars. The two met in 2015 as co-workers at a real estate brokerage firm. The job provided an online virtual space to help bring employees together. So when they got engaged, taking the wedding ceremony to the metaverse seemed like a natural next step. We actually have a support group that meets ahead, ahead of time, making sure you know their avatars are set up, the room's set up just right, get music playing, be ready to handle the size of the audience that, that they're coming. That's Alex Howland, the co-founder and president of Verbella, the virtual workplace and events company that designed the couple's e-venue. He said couples can create many of the same experiences at a virtual reception that guests would experience in person. Uh, things like different dance moves, different gestures, ways to celebrate, ways to get on camera and, and actually give a toast if, if you want to. One study found today's average wedding can cost anywhere between twenty dollars and $50,000, depending on size and location. But for virtual events like weddings, the price is in the details. A lot of our corporate events are in the, the ten dollars to $20,000 range, but depending on the size of the people, the kind of customization you want to do, the options are, are endless. Technically speaking, weddings that happen exclusively in the metaverse face legal obstacles. And in states that do allow virtual online weddings, folks getting married are usually required to use video conferencing technology that doesn't distort their appearance. But the Gagnon saw the virtual ceremony as a way for friends and family who couldn't physically attend because of the pandemic or otherwise to still be there. Tracy and Super Dave Gagnon. A romance kindled in the virtual world grew into reality. The Gagnon say the metaverse has opened up their lives to new possibilities. The real power of, of the metaverse is it, it, you know, it's built to help people connect and to grow and to learn from each other and to see the world through different eyes. Callan, this is fascinating. I have so many questions. <laughs> I, I've, I've been to a Zoom wedding. Obviously, we've all been to a Zoom wedding at this point. I know how to attend one of those. You just join the Zoom meeting. Um, how do you attend a metaverse wedding? And, and the avatar, does it have to look like me? <laughs> well, the avatar should look like you because, you know, when you log on to these uh, metaverse weddings, you are a fully virtual character. You are kind okay. of signing on in a similar way that you would in a, in a Zoom meeting, but you are exploring this fully 3D world. And once you're on, you are creating that avatar. I think that's probably the uh, most fun or most like in-depth part of this is you're creating an avatar. If it was me, I'd be making my hair blonde, my eyes green, my dress black. <laughs> but if I didn't want a black dress or I wanted to wear something different, that's, that's open to me as well. So it's very accessible and it's very interesting to well, see how people are using it. That's exactly why I wanted to ask, and just quickly here, how accessible is it? I mean, can I figure it out if I'm not in tune with attending a wedding at a metaverse? Absolutely. It is not a difficult uh, thing to, to figure out. It is accessible for everyone, whether you're not computer savvy, whether you don't play video games. This is this is a very accessible tool. And also for people who are immunocompromised, who can't yes. travel, who have to go to 15 weddings this year. This is a way that you can make sure that you're attending everything. You're not breaking the bank and you're staying safe. All from the comfort of your couch without having Absolutely. to go buy a dress or a suit you're never going to wear again. <laughs> Callan Rosenblatt. Thank you for bringing this to us. We appreciate it.
That wraps up this hour, everybody. Hallie Jackson's going to be back in the seat for you Monday, same time, same place. Have a great weekend. Coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.